Okay. Hi. Um, when to bring it to speed, um, the thing is, once you start delocking, you go to the kernel with the U order, which is actually the address of the lock. And in kernel, we have a huge um, hash table, which we address the lock to one of the hash buckets. And you can have hash collision. And so it comes that um, two completely different processes share the same hash bucket. And that's where we have uh, problems on RT when one process um, slows down the other. And additionally, on Numa nodes, it's you have the problem that the memory for the hash buckets is allocated always from one NUMA node, actually. Um, no. Pardon? No. So we could do that interleave, which would be the same default anyway. It does some kind of uh, VMALOC thingy right now. It's VMALOC. Um, Yeah. It, it should be not global in the first place. Oh, yeah, there's that. So we will try to get rid of the hash buckets, get it later. Um, we did some testing uh, of four versions of how we could fix it. And this was the box we used. You could say it's big iron. Um, all four versions are in the Git tree if you want to look it up, test it. Um, we had some, we used benchmarks uh, based on per Futex bench. We extended it to use um, an end parameter to specify the NUMA node um, you run it. So this is um, version zero, this is state of the art. Mainline. Mainline as is. Um, on the left side you have 64, 128.512.1024, that's the number of Futexes. And on the left side, you see T8. This is, you have f um, eight threads. So you have, on the left side, you have eight threads uh, working on 64 futexes all, all over again. And the four bars are like NUMA node 1, yeah, zero, two. 0, 1, 2, 3. And so it's eight threads per node. Eight threads per node, and okay. four nodes in parallel. Run, doing a um, futex wait with an invalid argument, which means it does a um, hash bucket lookup and comes back again. And it does like six million times a second. So that's what it is now. And you see the NUMA nodes are mostly performing the same way. And it gets slightly worse if you go like for 60, 36 threads. So we go down to like three million operations a second. Okay. Um, this is what I call version 13. We do an ICU lookup. So um, each, each log gets a P thread attached, where we put it in a global ICU list. This is the module thing you, I found. Um, we put it in there, and each time you do the wait. Yes. So that's yeah, the, the, the test case is that you're iterating over the 1024 futexes. Right. And then just. Uh, so, uh, so the lock contention increases as you increase the number of threads. The, the right. The lock that there's no locking, we do RCU for lookups. So you have only a lock to add and remove. The futex contention, excuse me, increases as you increase the number of threads. Oh, we have no contention at all. So we're just locking. exercising the hashing. Just okay. the hash. Yeah, the okay. hash lookup. Yeah, right, then. So it's just um, ACU read lock, um, look up in the RB tree with um, unlock with increment of the users and then just get it back. Okay. Right, so we need an ACU attach, uh, we need an attach from the user space to say this log is now attached to uh, the process. And so we need a kind of hint for that. Um, this is version 10. This is where we had um, a hash per task, which got knocked down because we could have hash collisions within a thread, uh, within the task, like two separate threads. But it's, what? 
if not now, then in five years or so. Now, um, so that's where we, it scales pretty nice for all nodes and yeah. This is um, unique IDs. This is where if you do attach, the Cisco returns you an ID number. The ID number is the position in the um, array. So we don't do um, RCU lookups, we just grab in the array and take it out. We still have RCU for the um, size of the array. And I punched it really huge to fit all of them, like, right. So this performs best. Um, right. Um, if you see, this is slightly better than the per process approach. But um, the global thing had uh, 64,000 hash buckets, while we here have only two, uh, 256. So it's no surprise that it performs slightly uh, worse. Now, these are the four approaches in, in comparison. And the question is, which one will it be? Or do anyone has another approach? Um, user land needs to attach up front, and the operation for lock, unlock, and so on has an, a modifier for attached. So we can distinguish them both, whether we look in the global hash tree or in the per, uh, per process hash tree. We, need, um, we cannot attach unconditionally because um, you could run out, out of memory. <laughs> So I try to avoid any um, lib uh, glibc modification, but um, this works only with th this one. Because you can then um, do the preload thingy up front if you want for RT or not. But um, ASLR and stuff like that make all kind of fun. And this thing is complicated because glibc has almost no no space to store the identifier. I found a variable you could cut in half. So we have like one 32-bit and you have two 16-bit. Then we are limited to 65,000 logs. It could work, but... Per process. Per process, right. Well, I mean, that's really enough. Then you get Java thingy and... <laughs> <laughs> So everyone uses but Java. I, I believe that in Kipper and UXT you probably have bits available. It depends on whether you need them in, in pure form or whether you can combine them with other things. And if we like, if we can remember correctly, there there's there's some space that you could probably cover. So that's not an issue then. It depends on how much you need and whether you you know whether we can store those bits for the ID, for example, together with other bits. Just extract them, or whether the kernel needs to. No, the kernel doesn't doesn't need them. So I guess we could spare to get some bits out there. For example, the mutex kind is just uh, enough so far. I think it's not exposed directly. So at least we no, have other bits exposed. for uh, so for things the like elision. The only thing the kernel cares about is the 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 the, uh, the, the mutex itself. And, and this type restriction is a bit of Well, that's the idea. That's what I said. If you do go for 16-bit, you can have 65,000 logs. Then that, that's there. That's over. If you give more bits, then we can use more logs. And would this need uh, additional APIs on the user space side? Mm. Can this be done in general? Well, the thing is, if you do things like pfread mutex in it, and you can hide this attached thing in that in it, then we have no API changes at that point. But from the main page, pfread mutex init cannot fail. 
but if you run out of memory in kernel, you can fail. So. But we can continue without attaching or not. Yeah. You can, but then you have different behavior, and you have no way to query it because you have no API. But do, do you have just different performance behavior or different? Yeah. Well, but the thing is, if you have two threads sharing this, the global hash bucket, and you, you have query it. Not it doesn't have to return a failure. You can just query the mutex, right? You could ask the mutex whether it's attached or not. Yeah, you don't check the return code. You just inspect the mutex. This well, sure, but this is API yeah. change. So we get one NP, I guess. But so we cannot do it without. That's and that's why. Because to so if, if we are on the global hash, yeah. we can run into the uh, possible priority inversion. Oh, I see. Because two different processes can share the same slot. But you can only initialize a piece of mutex one, a piece of mutex D once, right? That's a, that's and then you share it with other processes. No, so the scheme we are doing with the unique ideas. Uh, so there's two ways. One, one, the one which uh, we posted where you commented that, uh, which is basically makes it work for both uh, private and shared mutexes. But then the new scheme we have where we just use a pre-process storage space in the kernel that just will work for private. Okay. And private is what we are really concerned about. I screwed the shared ones, I mean. They shouldn't be there in the first place, or at least not for critical stuff. But they were there in the first place. The private came I later. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but so right. So everything here is just for the private Fudex. Shared is out of picture. No one cares. So because let me just if we do, up on that, if you do share, then you need storage space uh, for <laughs> sorry. If you. Uh, Want to do shared, then you need storage space per process okay. in user space per per mutex. So this means you even need to have storage space per thread. So you have to store it in the TLS or whatever, and then you have to connect it to your stupid mutex. My follow-up question is whether in the real-time uh, use cases, do you actually not care about process, process shared? Or no. is this specifically for this optimization? Uh, the shared has the problem that you have to go for the MMSM. And you can have the problem that one thread with low priority is acquiring memory, and the other is doing some completely something <laughs> irrelevant, and that's where you uh, get starved. And so you don't want to do this. So a high priority so thread usually does not do share. So if you really want to share uh, information between uh, um, a high priority process and some low priority process doing logging or whatever the hell, uh, then you are way better off doing some lockless ring buffer scheme or something like that. Avoid the whole locking mess completely. So it wasn't clear, the background to my question is because if we can ignore process shared, yes. then we can use dynamic memory within glibcy, and we can potentially build our own weight queues and stuff like that, which might help us solve the, uh, the convo issue, for example. Yeah. And so, I mean, if process shared doesn't matter, we can do a lot of things in user space. I think we, we can ignore process shared for that particular performance thing. I mean, even Java is not process shared. It's process private. Even what? Java? Java. It's one big <coughs> pile of threads. Threads. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. In, in any variation of the pronunciation, you can put it. You're right. You're right.
So the, the real question here is, if we want to have that performance gain and uh, actually a mechanism to guarantee that we do not run into arbitrary priority inversions, uh, we, we can document that this, there is no such guarantee for, for shared and tell people do not use it, think harder. Um, we have a lot of such limitations in RT, obviously. Um, and then, uh, I mean, the question is, can we really get away with hiding it completely below uh, p-thread mutex in it and things like that? Or is there other stuff required which we need to think about? So there are ways to initialize uh, mutexes, uh, p-thread mutexes in user space uh, with uh, static assignment. So you don't need to actually do an uh, init call. So yeah, but you can do it on the, first, on the first operation. Yeah, you can do it lazily, yeah. That's also interesting for non-PI because that's what you're seeing. Can you can you fall back? Go back to the, the slide where we have the, the mainline behavior. That's what you're seeing. There is a fact of ha uh, hash back contain. No, go, oh, go okay. just to the the zero. The, zero. Um, the degradation is just an effect of hash back bucket lock contention. So you're you're having lock balancing around, which is problematic in terms of performance. <laughs> yeah, but uh, in terms of general general purpose lock, uh, performers are much more concerned about the lack of proper spinning and back off and gilipsy. Um And the uh, the uh, you know we have a very very simplistic lock implementation, and so I think at the point where we get to suffering from contention in the futex so in the kernels blocking mechanisms, this is much further into you know into the future than what we can fix right now. So some database company, some, some, some unnamed database company, um, could not or would not use the Futex system call. They, they weren't even considering GLIPC. They were not interested. Um, the Futex system call, um, because of um, cache bouncing on the global scale for their NUMA systems, um, having this per task state avoids the entire global hash um, and solves uh, NUMA issues for them as well. So but I think we need to look at the bigger picture. And the bigger picture is if you're really a high performance database, right? you don't want to oversubscribe your cores with threads. right? So you have ideally one thread per core running, or whatever kind of resource you do, hyper threads or whatever. And then you want to keep them busy, and you don't want them to block. So when you actually block, it's really you're you're not in the optimal case anyway. At least that's, that's my word view that I have. It matters to them. That may be right, but if if you think about parallel programs and things like that, and you know where high performance programs are moving, then you don't really want to block. Either you want to do sensible work done, or you want to you know not do anything at all. Which, in that case, you might actually sleep using few texts, but uh, I don't think the we should really not consider the kernel side blocking as any kind of way part of the, the fast path, right, or the performance critical path. And we have a lot of stuff in GLIPC to fix to actually get there, and you know the mutex, the simplistic mutex implementation that we have, or lock implementation is part of that. But I think that should be goal. User space spinning just does not work in the oversubscribed case. Uh, just like user space the, spin looks. I think general purpose right now. PI might be different. So with, with priority inversions, it's different. But even in, in um, the general case, um, so the, the atomic operation you need to do is some 20-odd cycles. 
kernel entry in XA, there's 100 cycles. So there is a very small number of cycles left in which user space spinning can amortize anything. That's true, but if you enter the kernel, you also uh, you'll most likely access more cache lines that you might need in the user space. <laughs> um, and the the just the, the kernel entry and exit overhead, I think it's just part of the problem. And other parts are where you get actually get the information about the critical sections, for example. User space might know much better whether the critical sections are short or long-lived, right? So it might make better automatic tuning and, and, uh, and adaptivity of decisions. The kernel, on the other hand, has other information, like, you know, will it deschedule the thing soon or something like that. So I think if you really want to look at this, we need to find a good balance between the different information that we have available on both sides, because it also affects the interface that we put in between, right? If we make a simplistic interface in the middle, we'll lose information from either side. You know, regardless of whether we solve it on user space side or on the kernel side. So in general, we should rejoice as user space gets their locking right to begin with. Um, in the high performance case, people don't care. Um, they'll fix their stuff any which way. They will not use glibc, they wrap their own, or they even hack the kernel. Um, and I have not yet seen anybody request um, anything across this boundary, um, like what you describe. And I mean... Can you start up the sequences? I mean, it's not specifically the same thing, right? But when you think about, you know, the kind of... The more abstract thing that they request, for example, with the restartable sequences, is it's per, per Numa node or per CPU data. Um, it's the ability to be preempted while doing stuff. Um, you know, how would you build a high-performance lock implementation, right? I think with the optimistic spinning, you the kernel makes sure that it doesn't keep spinning when it's going to be preempted and things like that. Um, maybe there's, there's something similar, right? So I think the underlying abstract problems are, just, are, are similar. And so I think there is, uh, there, there, there could be use for that, and I think there's interest for that. Although I agree that a lot of people will just probably, right now, build, uh, will build their own and they will not use glibc. But I definitely like to get to the point that, you know, glibc locks are fast because they are used in, in, in C++ applications and so on and so forth. But uh, I don't know, have you seen Wyman's work uh, he was doing recently? Wyman Long, he's, he's here in the room where he is. He was uh, implementing a separate a few text separation just for very, very simple few texts, not the whole op space and whatever. Um, and so he does optimistic spinning in the kernel. So the, the, the advantage the kernel here has of course, he doesn't know how long is the critical section to be, but the, what, the, what the, current, uh, the kernel knows and what the user space can't know is, okay, the owner is not longer on the CPU. So the owner is not longer spinning on the other core, so that's the perfect point to give up the CPU and go to sleep. So that's, so, so the, I think we, we we, we run into a, a, a whole bunch of questions. Do we need more um, special case Futex operations instead of that whole insanity of Swiss Army knife Futex operations which we have now? Or not, a, not instead, but maybe a side of them? to solve particular problems? So I, I, I'm all in favor. Um, Futex has hurt my brain and special purpose. One. I, and we can't get rid of the, the ones we have. Um, the, it's just not going to happen. No, they're, n they're not going away. But uh, wouldn't the, the Convar thing be easier if you had special purpose 
build stuff just for Convar. This is true, but um, I think it would be it would be a too tightly coupled solution if the kernel would try to really solve exactly the Convar semantics and exactly you know the need for blocking that we have in barriers and in semaphores and in read write locks and in whatever else people might want to do, right? Um, so the Convar, for example, and we'll touch on this later in the talk, uh, is for example could benefit of more of the waiting condition if the kernel would be aware of more you know, more semantics about what kind, of, what kind of condition you're actually waiting on. Right now, it's more likely a flag. It is specialized, but it's not specialized in the way that we say, okay, now we're building a mutex, or we're building a lock. It's specialized in saying that, okay, we make the, we make the abstract thing more powerful. I mean, the, the <laughs> we allow for the specialization by providing for encoding of the, val by allowing the user of the Futex to uh, provide for the policy of what they encode in the Futex word. The, the problem I think that we actually run into is when we break that by imposing our own policy. That seems to be where a lot of the pain in the Futexes comes from, or all those places where we I impose our own policy. But we will talk about that, so maybe we should give Sebastian his time <laughs> back and not hijack. <laughs> yeah, well, there's probably no resolution of that problem right now, but we are running short of time as well. Thanks, Sebastian, for putting the information together.